I did learn something recently that I want to say before you begin that um, it was an attorney that was at an, one of the MMA conferences and she said that um, board members need their cameras on at all times. Good to know. So just that before also, I think from the AG, yeah. All right, well, seven o'clock and um, I'll call the planning board to order and then um, Carolyn, do you think you're still going to have a uh, quorum for the select board or we don't need to do? Um, I, I don't see any quorum right now. So uh, I would just say I'm, I'm, I'm your it. <laughs> you're it, all right. If, if, uh, if you get one more person and I don't notice, please interrupt me. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you, Annalee. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, I'll call the meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board to order on February 7th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Um, our meeting is normally held at the municipal offices. Tonight is being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending provisions of the open meeting law MGL chapter 30A section 20. Meetings are typically broadcast by FCAT and I believe that will be the case tonight. I don't, although I don't see them here. Um, the uh, links for the Zoom meeting tonight are found at DeerfieldMA.us and um, so I will remind everyone of our meeting guidelines that we want to speak one at a time, follow the Deerfield Code of contact, Conduct to be respectful, considerate, and courteous, um, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. <coughs> so uh, board members in attendance, Rachel Blaine. Here. We're going alphabetical order tonight. And Mary Cloutier. Hey, Mary Cloutier here. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson here. Hi, Andrew Denise Mason. Denise Mason here. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. And Kathy Watroba. I see Kathy Watroba here. Kathy, you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Kathy Watroba here. And Emily Wilkel here. Yet again, another 100% participation. Love it. Um, <clears throat> our minutes from uh, January 3rd, 2022 are not yet available for distribution. So we'll defer those until um, next meeting. Um, new business. Uh, we have uh, uh, Bob Walden here for um, our building inspector. And also we are discussing an a and for 53 Husik Road. Um, <clears throat> So, Bob, would you like to uh, take it away? If you'd like to, Bob, do you want to introduce the, um, yeah. give an overview of. Um, Sorry, I was muted. I was just wondering, is it possible for Jen to share that or the a and I've or got it too. Sue or me Sue or somebody. Um, I, you want me to, Jen? Yes, please. I don't have it with me. Okay, yeah. your screen. Here we go. Also, I just wanted to say I talked to the applicant and her son-in-law is having some medical uh, procedures done and she apologizes for not being present tonight. And I was at the meeting with Bob when we looked at the ANR. So I said I would speak on her behalf with Bob. So <laughs> here we go. So here is the um, the map. Would that be better for you, Bob, or would you prefer the? Yeah, that way I can maybe kind of okay explain it. So that the along here the ten acre parcel here. I don't know which way we're facing, so north or south, but owned by Richard E and Marianne Foster. Here we go. want to split off the piece that says 3.496 acres and convey it to their neighbor, which is um, their daughter and son-in-law. And it's 
pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just going to be used as extra land for farming. It's not going to be a building lot. So <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward passing of land over. That's about all I have to say on that one. I don't see any <laughs> issues with it. Okay, um, as a reminder to the planning board and to our honored guests, um, as we look at endorsing uh, in our applications, the three main areas that the planning boards need to address is that all lots abut a qualified way, um, meaning a, a public way that they have adequate frontage and vital access exists for each lot. There's quite a few court discussions about what's vital access, but in general that there is um, emergency vehicle access. So those do certainly mean frontage, access, and uh, being on a qualified way seem certainly, in my estimation, to be satisfied. Any other discussions from any of the board members? Uh, yes, Denise? No, I, I'm familiar with that parcel. I, actually, that is north, going north on Hoosick. Okay. So yeah, there is definite, you know, there's, there's good access. I, you know, I have no problem with that. Excellent. Okay. Any other, um, although we can't have discussion, if we can have a move to endorse the ANR on 53 Husick Road. I move to endorse that. I second it, Rachel Blaine. That's Thank you, Denise and Rachel. Um, do we have any discussion? All right. So we'll have a roll call vote since we're remote. Uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. And Anne-Lee Wolfkel, yes. So we will endorse it unanimously. And um, thank you. We also, as um, planning board members saw today, um, had a last minute um, request today uh, filing for a um, another ANR so that would officially go under um, items not anticipated within 48 hours but since we're addressing ANRs let's just do them together so um, Bob here's this there are two maps but here's this map which shows here's the this is for our uh, ANR for uh, Clark's Crossing. Here's Clark's Crossing Road and the railroad track spot under consideration. Bob? Yeah, so the, the old railroad bed is the piece that the person bringing the ANR wants to purchase and join with his piece of property in the back, which is currently landlocked. This will not be a building lot because it does not have enough frontage, I believe, or I can't read that number on Clark Road, but that's not his intention. His intention is just for access to his landlocked piece of property to be able to access it for farming or logging or something of that nature. So I didn't see any issue with this either. It seems pretty straightforward. Um, and and so the access, the vital access would continue to be here and then come down here, correct? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and um, this is a public way here, correct? Obviously Greenfield Road is. Yes, yep. <clears throat> and in terms of, of frontage, it doesn't need frontage as a building lot. Um, right, I can't read that number from here. Um, um, for eight, some reason, I don't think it is 200, but it not, with my bad eyes, it might be, might actually be 200. Huh. Um, well, in any event, they marked the it as way. not a building it's, lot. Yeah. It's the frontage here. It, uh, um, the other over this, on Clark. Like, well, it doesn't yeah, matter. I, yeah, Off no, see, Clark. yeah, that's under 200. So it wouldn't be, it would never be able to be a building lot without a variance, but that's not their intention. Oh, here, this little guy. Oh, no, the yeah. other side, oh. the, the other side, but it's it's 180 or something like that. Yeah, I see. Okay, 123.58, I think, yeah. Okay. But yeah. That, yeah, 123.58, yeah. So it's not, it wouldn't be able to be a building lot, but that's not what they want to use it for, so. 
Okay. I didn't have an issue with this either. <laughs> All right. Um, planning board questions of Bob? Yeah, yeah, I just have, I'm sorry. I yes, have one question. You know, I know Child's Cross, I know Wells Cross, but I've never heard of Clark's Cross. So I can't figure out exactly where that is. So mm. I was, I, I visited it. This is Andrea speaking. I visited it today. It, the Clark's Crossing Crossroad is kind of part of Magic Wings parking area. Mm. Oh, uh, okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mr. Avery is look here this evening. If anybody has questions for him, pardon me. Oh, the, the applicant is here this oh. evening. So, if you have any questions, uh, certainly. Tom, Tom Avery, Mr. Avery, <clears throat> Mr. Avery, do you um, want to speak or represent this? Ah, uh, you're muted. I don't really have anything to, to add at this moment. Okay. Good to have you here anyway. All right. Uh, could we have a motion to um, endorse the A B A and R for this um, piece of property? This is Andrea. I endorse this. And so moved. I, I suggest. I think we should endorse this. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Do you have a second? A second, uh, and Rachel. All right. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All right, and we'll go back through uh, alphabetical order. Rachel Blaine? Rachel Blaine, yes. Anne Marie Cloutier? Anne Marie Cloutier, yes. Andrea Liebson? Andrea Liebson, yes. Denise Mason? Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba? Kathy Wittroba, yes. And Emily Wolf Cole, yes. Uh, so again, it is unanimously endorsed. Congratulations, Mr. Avery. <laughs> All right, and I'll stop the screen share here. Okay. <clears throat> um, so moving forward um, on our old business with the um, public hearing for our 135 North Main Street Park and Playing Fields. Um, this public hearing is a continuation of our previous uh, public hearing on January 1st um, to let people know the process that we'll be looking at. Um, first of all, to welcome Adam Costa here this evening. I, there's the logo. Um, Mr. Costa is representing the planning board tonight in this, um, in this action. Um, I'll be giving an update on some peer, um, peer review uh, update. We'll have then um, response um, to public comments by um, town departments and Proterra Design. Um, at that point in the, in, those response, in the response to the public comments, and first of all, I'd like to thank members of the public who have submitted um, questions to either members of the planning board or um, members in the uh, town, um, Sue Brulette or um, Jennifer Gannett in particular. Um, thank you very much. This is a good way to be heard. Um, so um, we will be, the, the applicants will be addressing some of those um, comments and the planning board will have some dialogue with the applicants um, certainly this won't be addressing all of the questions that have come forward and also in particular a reminder that um, these questions um, that are being addressed tonight are really within the criteria of site plan review, um, the criteria section 5470 and 5480 um, um, that are our, um, our criteria for site plan review um, approval. Um, so those are what we're confining our comments to tonight. Um, public comments then um, will occur and then we will consider our next steps. So. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, someone, who is this? Ah, it's, it's, yes. it's, it's Adam Costa. I apologize for interrupting, but I, <laughs> I'm looking at your agenda here and I see that you have this public hearing posted for 720 and I see that it's only 714. 
Oh, oh because, my goodness. Okay. Uh, you, you, move, you move quickly through your A&R. So because this is a public hearing, you can't open it prior to the time that it's been noticed on the agenda. All right. Let's, um, since um, we did have questions about the <clears throat> Sugarloaf condos, the stormwater management issues, let me scoot to that because that's a, a short item here. Um, I will make note that um, I understand that I am a butter of an a butter of a 300 footer or whatever. And so um, I can introduce a topic here, but I will be, recuse myself from any further discussion and pass um, the discussion on to um, or the, the topic on to Denise Mason, who is our vice chair. So Denise, there you are. Hello. Thanks, Natalie. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that the stormwater permit has been issued. The building inspector is working on monitoring, you know, to be certain that the construction is compliance with the permit and the building inspector is dealing with this, not the planning board at this point. Uh, the only way this issue would come before the planning board is if the applicant files for modification of plans or if the building inspector files an enforcement issue. So at that time, I don't think we really have anything else to say on that matter. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. And we're still inching towards 720. Sure. Okay. Um, our mail for the evening was um, interestingly um, uh, several, where am I here? Um, uh, what the Waitley um, Planning Board is ha ha did have a site plan review for an indoor marijuana cultivation facility, and then also Greenfield um, has had two public hearings. Um, one was for a special permit to convert a, a carriage house to a detached ADU, and another was a special permit granted to convert existing barn to a fourth um, fourth dwelling unit. So. Um, issues certainly going on around us continue to go on in terms of the marijuana cultivation, but also in terms of finding other ways to um, bring forward um, housing in our area. And housing inventory. And yes, yes, absolutely. Carriage houses and barns. Um, and I'll mention as an aside also, boy, we're just really getting through the budget here or the, the agenda here, this is cool. <laughs> um, the um, planning board budget as an update, um, we did mention at the last meeting that um, we did have a deadline for uh, submitting our planning board budget. And there was a question about, um, <clears throat> certainly has been a lot of interest in the town about, uh, potentially proposing a um, planning board consultant and um, there with some consultation with the board and Brenda and Casey um, what we've decided is that the planning board budget in fact should be low can be level funded at the 7,000 that we've had for the last several years and um, we can go forward with making a proposal um, under contracted services rather than within the planning board budget as a as an employee. Um, I'll say as an aside, I've been talking with various leaders in the town. I've been talking, starting to talk with other planners in the area to um, try to get a better feeling for the really what seems to be a fairly wide um, array of job duties and um, responsibilities um, for planners. And um, I can keep the planning board apprised of that as the time approaches for us to, um, for the, especially the, um, <laughs> the finance committee to address it. Mm. So are there any, any questions in relation to that? No, okay, and I see 718, oh, Adam, you're gonna keep us to our, um, our minutes here. Okay. Are there any reports from any of the committees or um, any seminars that people have? Um, Andrea has her hand raised. Andrea, excellent. Andrea. <clears throat> yes, I wanted to let people know uh, that the Open Space and Recreation um, Planning uh, Committee met. Um, first of all, to let, uh, to congratulate us all, uh, 388 res uh, residents completed the survey 
and it was apparently the highest in Franklin County. So uh, FERCOG was very pleased that we had done so well. And, and very interestingly, 200, so of the 388, 370 were done online. So our community is uh, uh, absolutely um, accepting and um, that that's the way things are going to be happening in the future. That was really quite wonderful. We have not analyzed the results, but they are, uh, they will be discussed at our next meeting. Um, I did, th 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 there, we also worked on um, our goals and objectives, which are quite lengthy. And I tried to encourage the committee to start to focus in, uh, narrow things a little bit um, based on um, being uh, especially mindful of the new town uh, park and encouraged members of the open space committee to attend this meeting and to attend any other uh, meeting where there are hearings about said park. And people seem to uh, be um, interested in that. And I also wanted you to know that um, the members of the committee are quite interested in getting input from indigenous people uh, so that um, the full history of Deerfield is reflected in um, recreational activities. And uh, we are reaching out to, um, I'm gonna say this directly, I apologize, the Nolumbeka Project, which, um, which uh, does try to um, have uh, indigenous people provide um, help and a voice for uh, things that are going on in Franklin County. So I wanted you to know about that. And then we also started to think about some smaller projects where we could actually um, pretty easily um, accomplish. So one of them is that the Mohawk Mohican Trail, which is um, off Husik Road, uh, at least the entrance is, could be better um, identified, better labeled. And so that is one area that we think we could um, could do some very quick work on that would um, that would reflect better the goals um, of the Open Space and Recreation Committee. And then another thing that was discussed to um, that we'd like to have kind of high up on the list is uh, water access. So it's the rivers, it's um, how do we deal with um, providing educational materials, parking, environmental control, um, that all that sort of thing, especially around you know, our two um, incredible resources of the Deerfield and the Connecticut rivers. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So can I just, Andrea, just quick. Sure. So are you meeting with open space and rec? Cause they've always been separate. It's one, it's one, it's one Got committee it. um, right, right now. Got it. We have also reached out to the recreation department and asked them to participate a little more fully with our meetings. They are always zoomed at least in my uh, experience, and they are at about five o'clock. And so we're hoping that the rec department can participate without being overwhelmed. We do recognize again, like so many other parts of town, one or two people doing all the work and that it's um, quite demanding. And um, so we're trying to include them without burdening them. Thank you, Andrea. Um, well, I, let's see, I see that it is past 7.20 now. <clears throat> Maybe if there are other um, reports, we can save them for the time in the agenda when that comes forward. But thank you, Andrea, for coming forward then. Um, so <clears throat> back to the park. Um, first of all, in regards to the um, uh, the peer review um, with quite a bit of work on the town's part. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, quite a, the outreach was made to, uh, I think around eight or so um, possible firms for peer review. Uh, two have responded and um, Casey especially, and I have looked at um, the, the responses and one um, we both feel very comfortable um, with as being number one on the list. So um, right now um, there is some um, review 
by the um, uh, town council and um, the the firm um, in terms of the contract terms and it doesn't look like there should be any issue. Um, the hope is that within the next, actually, hopefully within the next day or two, we can um, sign the contract and get the peer review on the road. Yes, Casey? Good. Yes, going that, I was going to reiterate that. Yes, I'm nodding my head. I did get an email back from Drew Verdakis, and he's going to get back to us. He sent it to his contract people after we had ours review it. Excellent. Good. Um, um, and as I'm talking about signing the or thinking about signing the peer review contract, um, a reminder that uh, I believe for the a &Rs that we just endorsed, um, those do need to be signed um, officially, not electronically. So um, if everyone can, I don't know, pay their water bill and or their sewer bill and uh, sign within the next really um, 48, 72 hours, that would be great. Thank you very much. May I? Um, yes, I, Jen. Just uh, call Sue or call call me if because the building is still closed. So we keep the A and R in in Sue's office. So just give us a ring and we can open the door for you to come in and sign. All right. Thank you. We shall do that. Thank you for that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so response to public comments, comments that the public has given. Um, we did, uh, as we made note last meeting, uh, EMS and fire and public works have reviewed the plans and have, um, well, fire had one comment that was a little bit hard to read and that might come up in discussion tonight, but the others had no comments. <clears throat> they, um, we Tonight we do have, um, she, uh, Sergeant, uh, <laughs> I just almost gave you a promotion here, um, Sergeant Harry Ruddock uh, to address some of the questions that were brought forth in relation to uh, police department, but also in general public safety. So um, Sergeant, if you'd like to um, take over, thank you for coming this evening. You're welcome. Um, yeah. I, <sighs> We we reviewed the plans and and uh, and, and met with the uh, the planners and and uh, uh, most of all the safety concerns were were addressed uh, if not all of them um, and uh, um, sight lines uh, and everything looked good for us uh, um, access uh, for our patrol vehicles look uh, looks good. Um, and uh, any uh, other mitigating circumstances that may not be specifically addressed, we could probably uh, um, handle that. Okay, you did mention sight lines. That was one of the questions I think that came forward was um, the uh, turning uh, on either on North Main Street up out and into the park, but especially out of the park, wondering if there were going to be no parking signs there and if there would be a 50 foot or something approximate, um, no parking signs there? Yeah, I mean, we, we discussed that. that. That shouldn't be a problem. Uh, enforcement will not be a problem on that. Um, there's there's uh, um, embedded uh, uh, general no parking areas for there anyways. Uh, and, especially in front of fire hydrants, uh, intersections, driveways. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that should not be a problem for us. Okay. Um, I know there was some discussion last week about the, the tension between um, not having light pollution, but having enough lighting for safety. And also this is phase one and there might be more lighting in phase two. Do, do, does, the, does it seem that public safety lighting is adequate in phase one yes lighting is we we like night lighting um uh and uh we would recommend that for phase one okay so you'd recommend that so i guess when we talk to protear we'll understand how recommendations kind of get addressed um what are some other questions from some of the planning board members 
in terms of public safety. Jen, did you have something? I was just going to say that new plans were dropped off this afternoon from Proterra. So some of these questions that you're asking may already be on the plans because they were proactive in making new plans. So I had Sue upload them to our website. So if people wanted to get it to their own, that's where our agenda is. Otherwise, um, I mean, we could share a screen. I just have to get there in order to do that. But it's they're so you know large that it's kind of hard to to look at them. But Proterra will be able to um, you know, speak on behalf of those changes, but I think a lot of those um, will be on the plans. Okay, cool. Um, I know um, one of the questions that I had was the um, both on the street as well as uh, in the along the driveway access to the playing fields in the park, um, the shared use between pedestrians and bicycles, and often that's kind of challenging um is that in the new plans uh address would you like proterra to oh uh if if proterra uh sure 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 Can I, I have one question for harry sure do you are you andrea you had your hand up though so right my question is about um pedestrians walking on main on the main street that was my question, question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Rachel. That was the same thing. I think that the crossing the, I think Andrea and I, were, this was mentioned last time that the, the sidewalk is on the other side of the street. And so I'm imagining that, you know, for the high schoolers, uh, there's going to be some access, but that there would have to be some zebra or some kind of um, allowance made for uh, crossing the street at that place. Exactly. You know, we're, we're, um, we are, we, we would like to see crossing. Um, yeah, um, a crosswalk there would be, uh, would be great to be access uh, both sides of the street. I'd love a lighted crosswalk, to be honest with you there. But anyway, that would be, some, you know, that would be my, on my wish list. Denise and then, um, okay. Denise? Yeah, I was, well, just since the question has been asked, um, uh, I was I partic participated in a couple of webinars with the um, MMA conference, and there was one of the shared streets and spaces that there is possible funding that could be used for sidewalks and crosswalks and possibly speed bumps. So that's something that you know we'd be working on. I'd be working on th you know through CCI. Um, we're not having. Um public comments yet mr swayze i don't know if you're part of the public or <laughs> i'm the fire chief oh well excuse me <laughs> nice to meet you no we love nice to meet you. listen he's <laughs> nice you. with mr swayze <laughs> well, cool. all right because yes um we did have so, some questions yes yeah so uh captain seaman and i met with uh pro terra in the afternoon of december 30th they answered several of our questions and concerns at that time. The two remaining items that we had was to update our apparatus length on plan TM-1, which I think they did. And then we would we also stated we'd like to see an access road within 200 feet of the rear proposed pavilion. And I took a look at their revised drawings tonight and I see that they've got an access road heading out to that backfield. So I've just got to review the particulars of the, the weight allowance to make sure it works, but they, they did take into consideration our recommendations and uh, we thank them for that. Yes, we all do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I certainly did wonder, it seems like there's a lot of um, various points, there's fencing and wondering for both police vehicles, um, ambulances, fire, um, there is adequate access to everything uh in in the whole area that at least both of you are comfortable with your own vehicles yeah it's the access out back is through the basketball court uh the fencing is only on the front side of that basketball court it is not on the back side and that leads into the walking path and then it appears as though they have uh reinforced the grass area next to it to give us enough uh width to get out there with a, a fire truck or an ambulance Okay, certainly the fire truck is the 
the big baby that we are concerned about. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, anything else from Ms. Sergeant Reddick or um, Mr. Swayze? And Oh, okay. as far as access, we're we're satisfied with access for our vehicles. Uh, um, uh, in, in any spot we can't get to, uh, I mean, we can certainly get to by foot. Uh, um, certainly, we don't have the type of uh, large vehicles like the fire department has, but uh, we're we're good with that. Okay, good. All right, thank you, uh, Casey, and then Mr. Martin. Go ahead, Casey. Hi, Annalee. I just wondered if we could have uh, Attorney Martin and Jesse Moreno speak to some of these questions. We actually have some information that could benefit the conversation that was started. So, Jim, if you want to start. Yeah, that's the next. Uh, that was next. But I did want to give the, our public safety officers the courtesy of speaking first. Okay, good. So, um, Mr. Martin, and then. Um, I don't see if Jesse is here or. Yes, he's oh, here. here. Yes, there we go. Yeah, I'm here. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the two of you can kind of uh, tag team each other. Um, and um, thank you. Go for so it. So I thought, I thought it would be helpful to uh, go back to the uh, initial comment about that the plans having been slightly revised and that. Um, Jesse could walk you through those, and then we can further address some of the concerns and questions that were mentioned at the meeting and then submitted in writing afterwards, um, pr primarily focusing on, you know, crossing and safety. And we have some comments on that as well. So Thank you, uh, Mr. I think the board okay. will find it helpful uh, for Jesse to just uh, review quickly what was updated. Please. <clears throat> Sure, I can do that. Um, to try to share my screen here. Let me know if you guys see it. Um, yeah, there were there were several changes. Um, basically, it was prompted primarily to address um, some of the concerns that were raised um, by uh, police, fire, and uh, public safety, and also as a result of um, the town entering into an agreement with uh, GZA to do the notice of intent. Um, that's the process with CONSCOM. So um, uh, GZA was, is doing that work and they had a couple of um, um, suggestions uh, for us to alter the plans prior to submitting for CONSCOM. So uh, basically the plan changes were um, um, updating of the existing conditions plan, which is um, these sheets here, the EC1 plan, uh, based on their comment of about um, what resources were jurisdictional and what the CONSCOM approved um, through the RDA um, about a year and a half back. Um, they also asked us to clarify the wetland restoration area. Um, we kind of merged um, the fill area with, a rest, with some of the restorative efforts they had us separate those so it was a little clearer uh, what we were doing. Um, we also consolidated the wetland application area more along the back of the fence. Um, that was a comment for GZA um, to be more in line with um, what they were looking for, uh, for mitigation. Um, as was stated by uh, uh, Mr. Swayze, we did realign and provide a reinforced grass corridor um, to the back. Um, that's in this area here. Um, so this area here now is a, is, um, a standard pavement with the, the grass, like a, uh, engineered grass surface. Um, we, um, because this is going to be public bid, um, we didn't put a proprietary product on the plan. And, um, if you'd like some more information on that, we can get it to them, but we have to be a little bit flexible. Uh, because eventually uh, when this goes to be built, it's, um, it, it, it's a public bid project. So we can't use necessarily a proprietary product, but we can um, make a, a, a specification that has performance standards. Um, one of them being um, you know, to, to carry his, his heaviest apparatus. Um, in doing so here, we kind of align this a little bit differently. We also moved the pavilion to the east 
Um, one, to provide a little bit better access and have it be a little bit closer to the parking area. Um, Excuse me, Jesse, <clears throat> how would you like to address questions? Should we wait until you're done? Yeah, I got a few more things here and then we can we can talk okay. about some more questions if that works. Um, okay. Someone had mentioned fencing. So um, right now uh, there's fencing along this side and along here, and that's to prevent, you know, uh, vehicles, cars, things from being able to go onto the turf. Um, you know, obviously there's good pedestrian access. Um, so here, um, we redesigned the, the gate of the fence um, to allow the gates to be full height. That way, um, a, anything 12 feet wide, 12, 13, or 14 feet more tall can get through that area a little bit better. Um, as was stated, um, uh, Fire provided us with um, a template for their um, the actual fire apparatus that they would be. Uh, bring into the site their largest apparatus. So that's here. It's um, they provided this information to us, so we were able to um, run that template through to make sure that there's good uh, circulation there. Um, and then um, there was just a couple of typos on the site removal plan at the entrance, where we've uh, corrected some typos there, and on the on the landscaping plan. Um, that was generally what we've addressed on that. Um, and uh, certainly we can go into individual questions here. Um, planning board members? <clears throat> um, I was wondering, um, Jesse, when you talked about that enforced area, um, I'm assuming that means for driving the emergency vehicles across, and that means it's no longer pervious pavement, is that correct? Um, yeah, so um, this area here um, where, where my cursor is, um, one thing that pervious pavement generally isn't great at is um, really heavy apparatus. So um, in this particular area, this small section, we're going to make um, just regular pavement. And we've widened that area with, with a pervious grass um, pavement. So I think the result will be the same um, in the end. Um, it doesn't affect the drainage because we didn't take credit for that in there, even though we have it. Um, we didn't take full credit for it in there uh, to be conservative. So in this case, um, uh, based on the comment about being able to get that heavy apparatus back, um, we think that was the best way in this case. This is Andrea. I have another question okay. about 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 um, pervious uh, pavement. A number of people in the questions asked about whether or not the parking lot could be pervious pavement. Has there been any consideration about what that would entail? Yes. So um, we um, initially coming in into the project, um, it was hopeful that we could use um, pervious pavement in the parking area there. Um, we've done um, significant testing out there, and it just turns out that the, the, the groundwater being close to the surface, about 18 inches, and that it's a, um, a poorly drained area as far as um, allowing, uh, accepting water. Um, it, it, it percolates slowly through the ground. So, in fact, it's not a very suitable area there uh, where the parking lot's located to, to use that type of, of practice. Um, another reason, you know, 20, and the reason is, is because there's uh, filter courses, choker courses, and reservoir courses that allow um, water to be stored in there. And because that's 27 inches, and then at the bottom of that, we have to have two foot offset to groundwater to be able to use it. Um, it's it raised the site up even further than it is now. Um, so um, if if we were to try to incorporate that there, you'd have to raise the parking area another one to two feet, which certainly doesn't make sense. Um, what we were able to do is a lot of the walking paths um, don't have that same um, required thickness. 
Um, it's about half of that. So we were able on those areas to utilize um, a pervious pavement there. Um, I know that's been disappointing to some folks, but we just got to understand that um, we need to design uh, for the parameters of this site. And in this particular case, um, it, it wasn't a good choice in the parking area. Other um, planning board questions? Um, we had started to talk a little bit about the mixed use bicycle and pedestrian um, access within the park area in the driveway leading to the parking sure, lot. Sure. Is, can so you, you can talk that? about that. Yeah. So um, that's a good question that, that was brought up. Um, I'm not sure who, who would actually brought that up. But what we did in this case, um, we looked to guidance um, on Ashto and um, like a, what's called a shared use path. A shared use path is like what you'd see on a, like a bike path. I don't know if some of you have seen in Hadley or Northampton, parts of Amherst, they have a bike path. And the idea there is that pedestrians and um, bicycles can co-mingle um, as long as there's enough space, right? And in this particular um, project here, because Main Street doesn't have bike lanes, it doesn't have these things, the best approach we thought was to create a shared use path where pedestrians and bicycles could share it. Um, although the park, you know, will get, you know, some traffic, I wouldn't call it a, um, the, that pedestrian path, like a high use path, right? It, it's, um, I would call it, um, you know, it's a low volume use. Um, the other thing is, is the town has a bylaw on, that limits the width of the pavement for driveways. They limited it to 22 feet. So if we were, um, if we actually tried to do it wider than that, it would actually is not allowed in the bylaw. Um, we did look at um, putting in um, um, bike lanes, specific bike lanes, but those are minimum four feet. And if we have to, we had to add them on either side, it would result in uh, four feet more pavement for that entire width than what we show now. So in accordance with your bylaw, um, we thought this was the best approach because it, it provides um, bicycle and pedestrian travel. It meets the uh, width of the driveway and it also is minimizing impervious surfaces, all of which um, are in your new green bylaw. It's hard for me to tell from the map how wide is the current shared path. It's about eight feet wide. So basically double the side of, of a normal sidewalk. And do you know how wide, say for example, the NoHo or the Amherst bike? Um, those are 10, although we've done, we did um, a bike path extension a couple of years ago in uh, more of the rural part of, uh, of, of Northampton in the Florence area, and that was eight feet. They actually did eight feet there because it, it was a low volume uh, use. And Mary has her hand raised. And Mary? Hi. Um, I'm wondering, you're saying mixed use, and I hear pedestrians and bicycles, and I'm wondering about um, people who have mobility assistance devices and um, how permeable pavers will affect, you know, that sort of accessibility. I know that they're smaller, right? So that they would create a more patterned surface. So I, I'm wondering how, you know, uh, handy accessible. Yeah, that's a great question. So, and, oh, I'm sorry, um, I have one more question uh, no part to it, just so we can answer it all at once. And over the long term, because if they're smaller pieces, I can imagine more movement. So if you could talk to that too, that would be great. Yep. So right now, what we currently show is pervious pavement uh, as opposed to pavers. So pervious pavement would be um, like a, a typical like asphalt base, but it's open graded. Um, it's similar to, um, let's see, over in town, over by neighbors, you have a, um, a pervious pavement that's, that some people have uh, uh, brought, uh, brought up um, that the, uh, I believe, Mass DOT put in at the park and ride. It would be similar to that. Um, the, you could use pavers. Um, we're trying to stay away from that. In this particular case, 
because um, each one is proprietary. But um, to answer your question, um, there are non-pervious and pervious pavers, and they do have some that are available um, that do meet the criteria for um, ADA accessibility. Uh, in this case, we're proposing to use um, uh, like a paved surface, like you, like you, like you would see out at the at the park and ride. Uh, so it shouldn't have that that issue. Thank you. Uh, but to also answer your question, um, the shared use path, like a um, sidewalk, would be ADA compliant. So it would have uh, cross slopes that are not too steep, and it would be under you know five percent uh, slope. Terrific. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Good Great. question, though. Okay. Um, other, I guess, other, other questions. I mean, um, there's a little bit of uh, leading with site plan review and the stormwater management plan, but we certainly do need to look at minimizing um, the cut and fill, and especially the fill. Um, certainly a number of people have, have wondered whether or not we could, something could be done to require less fill. There sure looks yep, like there's yep, a lot that's of- Yep, that's also a great question. And it's an important one from our standpoint as well, because it goes directly to budget, right? So. Uh, you know, we don't want to fill more there than we need to. Um, generally, um, it's about three feet that we're filling. And the reason for that is because um, we have groundwater uh, 16, 18 inches from the surface. This is seasonal high groundwater, so in the spring. And in order to have, um, to provide mitigation for the storm events, we need to create um, a basin. And so we have to, we can't start that basin below the groundwater. We have to start it either at the groundwater or above it. And that provides our storage. So we have, you know, two to three feet of storage there. And then we need some room to, um, to get um, conveyances in. These are like pipes and under drains. So that sets the minimum height. Um, from there, um, this section of the field is based upon, um, the materials that we're using and the type of field. And we're actually working right now with a, um, a field specialist on trying to reduce those heights that we have in the plan um, to try to get us six inches or, or a foot or whatever we can get. Um, um, we're probably looking at being able to bring it down about six inches and, and that's, a, that's a big help. Um, someone had mentioned that there's five feet here. And I just wanted to point out that that is occurring um, at the middle of the field where there's an existing uh, farm ditch. So there's a farm ditch cut in the field that's lower than everything else. And if you measured from that point to the highest point, yes, there is a, there is a, a higher, um, higher amount of fill there, but it's a very narrow section. Um, so I just wanna say that we are cognizant of that and we do wanna work to reduce it. Um, but as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated because we need to provide um, the necessary slopes and drainage on the site. That's, that's a flat site. And we also have to have pitch on the field so that um, we get proper runoff. So um, it's a balance. We're working on it. We're hopeful we can uh, reduce it a little bit for you. Great. That's good. Um, Ms. Caswell, we're going to finish with planning board comments and then we'll have um, public comments. Um, so I'm not wanting to <laughs> ignore you. Um, what are the effects that, well, uh, tied in both for, well, irrigation and fertilizers for these big fields? Um, yeah. what, what effects will the fertilizers yeah. have on the yeah. wetlands? Good, and good, good question. Um, so Anytime you have a grass field, obviously water is important. Um, it's important for, for many reasons. And the amount of water is dependent on a bunch of things, right? The amount of water is dependent on the climate you're in, um, you know, how much the fields are being used, you know, how well they're maintained. Um, and, um, you know, especially during the growing season, they need to have at least one inch of water a week. Um, and so 
Uh, we're fortunate that the area that we live in gets, you know, 30 to 40 inches of water a year. Um, but as just like over at the high school and in other fields, it's very important that they're irrigated. Um, with that being said, um, you know, it was also um, mentioned about um, a fertilizer. This is also another important thing, um, just like folks that have nice lawns uh, that they maintain, um, you know, a, a maintenance plan for natural fields includes, you know, you got it's gotta be mowed, it's gotta be fertilized, it's gotta be aerated, it's gotta be, you know, overseeded to keep the grass healthy. Um, so all those things are important. Um, you know, if you can imagine, you know, one of the routine maintenance items of a field is to control weeds, right? Like, you know, broadleaf weeds that you might get on your lawn. Um, if those take over, they actually can choke out um, the good grass field. So, um, you know, maintenance and, and using of these um, of these these controls is is important. Um, you know, not only to you know protect the investment that the town has, but to keep it in in good good playable condition. Um, this would be very similar to what they're doing now at the high school. Um, in, in, in sort of other fields, uh, you know, high quality uh, grass fields that are that are in the area. Um, one question was brought up about irrigation and how can we make it more sustainable? Um, so we have an irrigation consultant and what they pointed me to um, is um, something that EPA has come out with. Um, basically, um, they started looking at um, how these facilities are controlled. And what they recommend is um, a, a, an EPA uh, approved uh, controller. It's called a water sense controller. And what it is, it's a smart controller that uh, differs from what you may have on, you know, at, at your local home. Um, what it does is it, it's a controller that, that um, um, meters the water that goes on the field based upon weather and how moist the soil is. So you don't get those instances where it just rained, you know, an inch the day before, and then the next day you're, you're you know, you have the sprinklers on. Um, so um, what are the consultant recommended is certainly specify um, one of these EPA approved uh, water sense controllers and they, and they can, um, they do a great job in, in, in saving, um, um, saving water. Um, so that's um, definitely something we would recommend and we can build into the uh, specifications here. Something I was certainly wondering about with both the fertilizer weed control, and that was a good explanation as well as the irrigation is, um, you know, there's Pebble Beach and then there's good enough. <laughs> And right. you know, right. where are we in that? In yeah. That yeah, you're you're in between. Yes. Um I I would say that this is um it's an important item. Um one thing um we could do um if the town is interested is I know uh the field consultant we're working with, um they do a lot of they do a lot of um outreach and uh study after these things are built so that um, the, the owners of these things can, can sort of maximize their use. Um, maybe it makes sense uh, for the town to, to maybe consult with someone like that, an expert, um, to sort of uh, put together a, a maintenance plan that makes sense for what you want. Um, that that's not Pebble Beach, um, that's not, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a field that's all weed, but but somewhere in the middle, something that balances the sustainability with um, the use of as a playing surface. Would that or, be different from the um, best practices maintenance plan that is proposed in the stormwater management, or is that? Yeah, that would be just for stormwater. This would be just for you know what best way to to manage um, uh, the use of the fields, um, how much maintenance they get, right, and when when they when they're maintained. So um, that, that's something certainly we could, uh, um, you know, provide the, the, uh, 
the town information and, and who we're working with to see if they'd be interested in, in, in doing that. But that's probably the best question because to be honest, that type of level is it's important to think about. Um, but those are that's a whole field. That's a whole profession where people do that. Um, and I would say it's best left up up to them. Okay. And um, you certainly bring a good point. You don't want to overdo it, uh, but you do want to um, keep up with it and, uh, and, 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 and do what's necessary. As far as the, as far as the wetlands, I know some things were brought up. Um, yes, you know, fertilizers yes, and wetlands. Yeah. Can I just chime in for a minute? Please? Yeah, no, no, no problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I'm uh, mindful of the uh, fact that we're, this is site design review and usually maintenance is a topic. I, uh, I'm compelled to point out that also for the development of parks and fields, there is a legitimate safety issue if you don't maintain the field properly. And there's a lot of literature out there, you know, whether you're a youth soccer player or a high school soccer player of injuries occurring unnecessarily when the fields dry out, ruts begin, and people have, you know, get serious injuries. So while it's not directly on point with site design review, it is an important point to maintain the field properly and the town is committed to that. This is gonna be an important investment as a park, not just a soccer field. And, they, uh, and so the, uh, the board as the applicant is committed to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Martin. That's important to know. Jesse, were you? Yeah, I was on? just going to say someone had brought up a question of are, are we concerned about the, um, you know, fertilizers getting the wetlands and things like that? Right. In, in streams, in, in uh, resource areas. What I would say here is it's important to have, um, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing uh, provide and put on the, the proper amount of, of uh, fertilizer. But in our case, what we have going for us here is um, we have, there's no direct discharge to, um, to necessarily a wetland or a water body. We have a drainage system, even on the parts of the grass fields, um, there are um, catch basins out there that collect any runoff and they direct it to our, our basins. Um, so there, there's, there is mitigation there. There is a stop gap there. So um, I would say that um, a more of a concern may be, you know, if it was a farm field in the floodplain, right? When um, there's, there's no buffer and there's no uh, um, drainage system in between the water body and the farm. In this case, um, we do have something there. We have a stop gap. Thank you. Um, Good. Are there other um, questions from the planning board? And if not, then we'll um, open it up for public comments. Oh, um, okay. So for public comments, um, similar to our, our uh, well, what we have in public hearings, um, please identify yourself with your name and your address and um, uh, limit your comments to two minutes, trying to be non-repetitive and respectful. And um, this is a time when you can make requests and questions that then uh, potentially could be addressed at other points um, by the applicants. Um, there won't be back and forth at this point. It would um, just be an opportunity, or not just, a, an important opportunity for you to address some of your questions. So Ms. Caswell? And then Mr. Hulchi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Julie Caswell, 248 River Road in South Deerfield. And uh, I just wanted to repeat the comment that I made, um, I think at, the, at an earlier meeting that um, when you sort of take the camera up a little bit higher, um, there seems to be not a real use of the opportunity of you know, planning the park as, as part of a system. And I'm particularly worried about, you know, this, um, if I'm a, a student at uh, say Frontier Regional and I wanna go to the park, I have to cross North Main Street twice. And to have that access, sideway, side uh, walk access be um, on the same side of the road as uh, the schools would be, fabulous and 
even more fabulous would be to be able to walk between the park and the frontier campus at the back, not on the street, which, you know, the town doesn't own, own the, the property rights back there. But, you know, that would be something that would actually lead to, if I wanted to just go there and walk, I could, you know, walk around there, walk through the back, walk around the track over at the high school and so on and so forth. So I'm just worried about the what's outside of the park in terms of how people are getting there and using the park. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hilchey? Yes, Tim Hilchey. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. So some of these questions are related to stuff that we'll probably want to talk about in our committee when the NOI comes to us. But the, a lot of these are directed to Proterra. And uh, I just wanted to ask several questions and then um, you can pick a time for them to respond. So the basketball court is gonna be on the same height level as the rest of the fields. Will all the fields be the same level or will there be different levels throughout the uh, property? I understand, uh, I also wondered, is there um, much of a difference between the fertilizers and weed control used when this land was farmed versus the fertilizers and weed control that you would use as a playing field. And I also understood that there's been some question about um, whether the number of spaces for parking, particularly in light of the fact that you're saying that this is gonna be non-pervious at this point, um, are there more spaces than are actually necessary to utilize this place? So those are those questions. Thank you, Mr. Hilshi. <clears throat> um, there's a person 413-665-7 something, 7867. Uh, yes. Yes, this is Bruce St. Peter, Snowberry Circle. You. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question. Uh, on the uh, basketball court, because that is also the underground stormwater storage detention system. And um, it, the detail calls for either pipe or um, chambers with it appears to be very thin pavement. If that's going to be an access for the fire truck, uh, is that designed so that that underground storage and the chambers will not be uh, damaged if it ever has to be used, as well as there is a comment in one of the things that that the select board made of using that basketball court for overflow parking. And there again, is that designed for vehicle traffic without damaging the underground storage uh, detention system that's underneath that basketball court? And those were my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. St. Peters. Um, South Deerfield resident? This is Judith Rathbone, 131 North Main. Um, I have a variety of uh, questions that I'd like to present. I'm, I'll start with the um, issues that are near and dear to those of us in the neighborhood. Um, we'd like to see the parking move to the back. It just doesn't make any sense to have it so close to the, to the front. The pollution will be unbearable and the noise. The band shell doesn't belong at the front. The neighbors believe it belongs at the back. Facing the railroad track, the noise again will be unbearable. Um, people are concerned about what the police want with uh, night lighting because night lighting sounds awful to all of us who treasure our lack of lighting. Um, people are very concerned about the, the runoff that's going to come into their basements and onto their land. They regard it as uh, inevitable, um, no matter what promises the engineering and design people make. And um, they're very concerned about that. Um, as I asked for at the last meeting, I asked for a fence. I need a fence between me and um, anybody walking down the road. It's not feasible to build a fence on my side a fence needs to be built on the side of the uh, access uh, driveway so that my privacy is protected because otherwise people can look directly into my property. And I know that um, 
the Dupuy family has been promised a fence and I would like a fence as well. Um, the next question is why there has been no competitive contract for uh, the work that Proterra is doing. Why is Proterra, that is my understanding is they're a contractor, why are they referred to as the town engineer? And why is um, a bid not put out, a competitive bid not put out for this work? And why is it always um, Proterra doing it? Why is there no competitive process? Um, in line with that, um, there should be, uh, there's a belief that people believe that uh, best practices for governance should be a running total of how much the uh, town has spent on this project at each planning committee uh, meeting so that people are aware of it and include how much has been paid to Proterra for their work and the source of that funds. Thank you, Ms. Rathborn. Is um, my two minutes up? It is, but um, that doesn't mean that we won't um, accept I'm your not done, question. Yeah. Um, before at the last meeting, uh, some residents submitted some very comprehensive questions that then were part of tonight's discussion. So, if you'd like to send them either in care of Jen Gannett or um, Sue Brulat or myself, um, that would be great, and we'll pass them on to Proterra. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bouchada. Uh, who is muted? Okay, there we go. Um, I'm just looking at the plans that are on the website that are in color and looking at the areas that are called um, proposed stormwater management, um, which is on the south, south side of the large soccer field. And there's a couple of them and then the proposed drainage swale. And I wasn't really clear when um, Mr. Moreno said that it's not connected to any other wetlands. Would that, are those gonna be standing water after a rain event? Um, and why are those areas gonna be Vegetated, um, how are they going to be different than a rain garden and why are they not going to be rain gardens, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, so rather than um, standing water, I think it would be great to create a way to absorb the water. And so I'm not sure what proposed stormwater management actually looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Boone and Patty. Uh, hi, Emily, Patty Pirog here, 127 North Main Street. Um, I just want to reiterate the same points that we brought up last time that we had the meeting. Uh, we have concern over the water runoff, rain runoff as well. Uh, we had problems, as I mentioned last time in the past when they did work at Frontier High School um, and it flooded our yard. We're already seeing issues with some of the stuff that's going on. So there is concern on our part about uh, what will happen with the water, where it's going to go and the effects to our property here in where or who we could go to if there is problems, how that'll be remedied for us. And then the other comment that we have is around the area of sidewalks. Uh, it was great to hear some folks on the planning board talking about raised sidewalks, lit sidewalks. Um, we drive around the entire area and we look at the different sidewalks they use in the colleges and stuff. And um, it works well in other areas. And uh, obviously, we, well, I can't say obviously, but we're on the same side of the street as the high school and the park. And we do prefer not to see a sidewalk go through our front yard. We'd rather see us use the sidewalks we have, uh, especially with so many sidewalks needing repairs as we hear at all the meetings. But we'd love to see lit sidewalks, raised sidewalks that would help slow down traffic that goes by. It would draw attention to people in them. Um, and we think that would be a good use of the area. That's all. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. And um, thank you to members of the public who have voiced the questions. I also thank Mr. Marino and Mr. Martin for addressing the questions, so many of the questions that were brought forward last time. Um, and there seems like there's been some creative work in relation to those questions. So um, I will encourage residents to continue to um, submit questions and um, I feel confident that our applicants are going to be respectful and address those for us. Um, it doesn't appear that we have any other questions from the public. No, 
We don't. Okay, thank you. So um, since we have not received our... Um, and oh, yeah. oh, yes, pardon me. Oh, Mr. Martin. Oh, yes, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I was going to uh, say two things. One, I want to remind the board and the public that, you know, there is going to be an independent peer review of uh, these plans uh, for the stormwater management and water, which seem to be a very um, major concern of, or source of comments. So I think that's important to keep in mind you know, once the uh, planning board finalizes the selection of a peer review person who will be independent. Number two, with respect to the comments about competitive bidding and, and Proterra, I, I think those are far outside the bounds of site design review. And um, I do not, that's a question for the town itself. And I don't think it, uh, I don't anticipate we'll be addressing those as on the merits of the project. And number three, since peer review hasn't been done and perhaps I'm uh, jumping ahead of you, Madam uh, Chairperson, but um, it's gonna be necessary to continue this matter. Um, and uh, the select board as the applicant has consented to such a continuance based on the fact that, um, uh, you know, despite Yeoman's work and sending out eight responses, there were very little, uh, ex, I should say eight uh, solicitations and only uh, very little response that the uh, administration took a while to, you know, find someone who would put a bid in. So uh, due to that delay, uh, and in fairness to have a thorough vetting, uh, with the select board as the applicant would agree to a continuance and an extension of the time to rule on this matter. And I think that's been submitted to you or is going to be submitted to you in writing. Um, is that correct, uh, Jen uh, or Casey? Yes. Yes, that was my understanding um, for uh, at the continuance potentially being six weeks from now, which is March 21st. So um, at later in the meeting, the planning board can address what we're doing about our, our schedule. But um, thank you, you were reading my mind with the next steps of, of looking for a continuance. Um, so, um, plan, uh, Casey? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. through you, I can share the screen for the applicant's continuance letter if you'd like, or I can just email it to you and blind carbon copy the board members. We th requested that continuance meet on March 21st with Carolyn signing that letter as a representative from the select board. Okay, thank you. And, but does the planning board sign also? Do I sign also? What we're doing is we're agreeing that it, form, we formally have to agree to a continuance. So we prepped a letter in the event that we knew we wouldn't be able to get a peer review by today. Yeah, it's it's so hard knowing who the we is and the applicant being the town. It's like <laughs> feeling schizophrenic here. Um, yes. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, is that Mr. Martin? Yes. No, no, it's it's Adam no, Foster. Adam. So, Adam. Uh, yes, uh, Adam. Just, just just a point of clarity. So this is no different. I understand. Understand it's confusing because you've got a, a a municipal applicant appearing before a municipal board, but. The same way that if an applicant, the private applicant will before you on a project and we're seeking continuances beyond self-imposed deadlines that might exist in your in your zoning bylaw or your subdivision rules and regulations or in state statute, uh, they would seek a continuance. You would accept that continuance, whether you sign it or not doesn't matter so much. What really matters is that the applicant signs it seeking the continuance and you accept that request. And then a copy or, or the original of that document gets filed with the town clerk's office. So that and same process will be followed here. Do you want us to vote on accepting the continuance or is that not necessary? I think you can do that as part of your continuation. Once this proceeding is concluded tonight, when you vote on a continuance date, you can also vote to accept the request of the applicant to continue it for that date. All right, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Are there other comments? Otherwise I'll entertain a motion to accept the request for continuance to March 21st and to sign the request. At what time? Oh, uh, 7 p.m. Thank you. I move that we continue to March 21st, this public hearing. I second it, Kathy Sylvester. 
Any further discussion? Okay, uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Mary Cloutier. Mary Cloutier, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Watroba. Kathy Watroba, yes. And Annalie Wolf, yes. So um, we will accept the continuance and um, sign it forthwith. We have lots of signatures to do. Um, I So uh, I think that's it tonight for the uh, public hearing on the park. Thank you for, um, I think, a, a thoughtful discussion. Appreciate very much the the um, the comments. And look at this. We're, <laughs> we're right on time with the agenda as we were planning it. OK. Um, Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Always glad to have you here. Um, <clears throat> so planning board priorities. Good night. Thank you yes. again. Be, Thank you, Mr. Martin and, uh, and uh, Mr. Marino. Thank you very much. And Mr. Costa, you're certainly welcome to continue, but <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Uh -huh. um, so planning board priorities. Uh, again, a reminder, we started some discussions last fall, actually, on priorities for uh, being sort of proactive with um, initiatives as well as uh, reactive and trying to be responsibly reacted to requests from, from the town and from the residents. Um, at our last meeting, I requested that planning board members send to me uh, in confidentially or blind copy um, their um, review of some of the priorities that have come forward as possibles, possible priorities for us to initiate. And um, I didn't quite hear from everyone, but um, heard from most folks. And um, the strong, um, strong placement of number one was that we work to hire a, a town planner position that is to be, could be determined exactly how many hours, how that would happen contracted services or whatnot. And as I mentioned earlier, we did um, just being proactive with that because there had been discussions, um, do have that um, as a potential um, budget item on contracted services. Um, second piece that came through um, was related to um, increasing, as uh, was mentioned earlier, our housing inventory, but in particular, our, uh, the accessory apartment bylaws, the fact that we um, are fairly close to um, a some finalized bylaws, but that we had some additional work that we wanted to do on that. And that came through as, our, our, as a second priority. And then sort of tied for third place was, um, <laughs> were three, three things actually. Um, a question about upzoning the town center, um, C2 and 1 or CDRD, um, potentially um, providing for more mixed use development, uh, increased economic development, affordable housing. Um, uh, also the question of frontage reductions, especially in the center village, um, for example, the um, FERC hog um, consultants mentioned or, or uh, planner mentioned that um, our old Cumbies lot is not consistent with what requirements are now for um, development there. And that would be something to address in the course of having frontage reductions that potentially could increase economic development. And then also um, the, the issue that our master plan is now 22 years old there. Theoretically, at least updated every five to 10 years. And um, and actually today, as I've been doing some research, talking to um, different town planners um, about what do they do, um, the town planner in Montague was talking about how he's got the complete streets and the master plan. And you know the plans are just well-worn and in front of him all the time in terms of referencing um, those plans in relation to applications that come in as well as grant opportunities. So um, the fact that we have a 
22 year master plan um, is a tad challenging. So um, I guess I would open it up for discussion with the, um, the, uh, the planning board on what you think about those results and how you'd like to sort of move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Kathy. So as, as number one, um, hiring a town planner, it sounds like that's already, you're, you're following up on how that might happen, who makes that decision already, is that right? I mean, do we have to say anything else about that or do any more about that well, ourselves? Um, potentially not. I mean, um, as we, as, as I talk with other towns, it seems that there are many different, or not many, but there certainly are, are a number of different nuances on how a planner is positioned, how they work with the ZBA, if they work with the planning board, with the select board, and um, uh, full-time, part-time. So probably coming back at times, coming back to the planning board to uh, get your ideas on how we can continue to um, sort of strengthen the appeal as well as then move forward to, you know, ultimately taking it to the um, finance committee and to the town meeting. So, yeah, I think we're moving forward on that, but we'll be coming back to um, discuss that with the um, the planning board, as long as the planning board also, I mean, <laughs> it sounds like that's number one, but I'm sure that that's what it is. It yes. would seem that they would be, you know, on, writing grants and such is my um, understanding which would pay for themselves i would think yes different planners um do more or less grants but the montague planner brings in 250 to 500 grand a year in mm -hmm. grants so yeah carolyn has her hand raised carolyn um i just wanted to just to fill you in um the select board is really supportive of a town planner kind of hours but um we we're just starting the budget process to be quite honest we're uh it's going to be a tough year so adding a few hours in the contracting services is probably something that we can do and we would certainly be encouraging you know someone to work with you but it's just not bringing in the money. You have to manage it, you know, the actual grant and all that kind of stuff. So oh, it'll, it costs more money than sometimes people think. Um, but Denise has been uh, working and following up on a couple leads we have of somebody that could be helpful. And um, then we, you know, just need some really qualified help to help you as the planning board from a professional point of view, but then also for us as well. So, um, I, you know, I'm, we're, we're supportive. We're gonna do everything we can, but it's very hard to commit to anything at this point. Oh, of course. Um, a better picture in a couple months, maybe, you know, definitely be going forward for town meeting, but I, I'm hoping that we don't, you know, our goal every year is to level fund services. So when you put something new in, something else has to give. So, I mean, that's really what we're constrained with. So, right. Understand. Understood. Yes. We're going to do the best we can. That's all I can say. We're supporting you. We're hearing you. Okay. Thank you. And it would be for more than just the planning board. Um, Andrea? My, my concern is finding someone who can bring some money into town through grants. We know that with the open space um, survey completed, we will be able to approach um, grants uh, from the state. But who is to write those grants? We don't have anyone right now. I assume with a master plan, the same thing would happen that we would um, become eligible for more grant opportunities from the state because we have this thing in place. But for, so I think first we have to do the hard surveys and um, and get the open space plan done, the master plan done, so that we can then say, okay, there are now should now be grants available to us. We need someone to pursue them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly the planner from Montague was saying that um, with ARPA money, or you know, but there's a lot going on right now with 
grants being available and in many cases certainly what he's doing is writing grants that include people who are uh, you know someone who will be doing the grant administration the grant accounting not just uh, get the grant and then passing it on to the to the town so that that certainly sounds <laughs> important um kathy i just wanted to add that you know i was struck by the fact that we're the fourth largest town in franklin county and we don't have a planner and the others do if i if i'm correct on that and we do have very few people doing a lot of heavy lifting and i think that's just not reasonable or sustainable so if we have all these grand ideas of what we want to do in town we really have to just you know find a way to pay someone to help us do it Thank professionalize you. the work <laughs> yes. Yes. yes not just okay. depend on volunteers and right. not um further burden staff who are working hard. Right. So, um, yeah, so an answer, brief answer, yes, we're, uh, I'll be bringing back to the planning board uh, discussion about um, this potential, potential uh, dress, you know, how this will be, be uh, positioned as we then move move forward so um yeah i think that the plan that the planner is definitely something that we 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 got, we got some traction a little bit of traction on and thank you carolyn um in terms of looking at our accessory apartment bylaw which was the second um second area that came forward but that's really only one of the number of um suggestions that FERCOG had in terms of uh, what might we be able to do to increase our um, our housing inventory? Um, conversations with the planning board about uh, about that about the accessory apartment bylaw and Kathy, and then uh, Denise, and then we'll take it. Just, to Carolyn. I just wanted to say I went to the Franklin Regional Planning Board meeting where they presented. Um, how Buckland went about uh, presenting to their town to get some changes for accessory apartments. And it was very effective the way they did it. I think we could do a really great job with their help. And I know there might be some problems in terms of staffing and getting their help and making a more you know, comprehensive and understandable presentation so that people actually see, oh, this is what, you know 60 feet of frontage looks like in town what we already have and um how we could expand housing in town and just how they did it was really effective and really well done so i think we need their help if we're going to do this i would just if we can get it yeah. you mean the fur cog yeah yeah well i think it was no, or planning board. whoever helped for buckland i don't know who helped buckland yeah, I thought it was the regional planning board, but I may be wrong, so I can reach out and find out. But um, it just, you, you could see it was very professionally done and very well done and was very helpful to the town to really understand what we're talking about when we say we want to increase accessory housing. What does that look like? You know, what does it look like to put um, a 900 foot accessory building on your land? How is that going to affect mm -hmm. the, the looks of the town? And um, they were able to show pictures of that in real, you know, real life pictures of houses, along with uh, superimposed drawings of what a house, attached house or detached, might look like. So people would say, "Oh, that's not so bad." You know, that doesn't have to look so. You know, what would you imagine? You're taking it out of your imagination and actually mm -hmm. showing a picture of that people can identify with right. so it's really helpful and I think we need a little more help that way if we're going to present this again mm -hmm. um, thank you Denise and then Carolyn yeah you know I, I think I think that's really important housing is really important but I think what's most important is affordable housing and you know you know I, I, I see things online and I see things on Deerfield now and people are complaining and if you look at you know, the income of some, some of the individuals who are expressing that, and you look at the rents, people can't afford that. 
And, you know, I know, you know I've, got, I've got neighbors and I think one who, ha she's got a two family house and one unit she's charging 1400, which I think is really exorbitant. And another is 1200. And you look at someone who's even making, if they're even making $15 an hour, guess what, they can't afford that. So, you know, all of this conversation is great, but I think the big problem is the affordability. Right, oh, um, Melissa LaRose mentioned that 41% of Deerfield renters are paying more than half of their income on rent. That's ridiculous. Um, and that could, that's where that could be potentially tied into the question of upzoning town center, which could provide more apartment, uh, apartments. Potentially, I guess. Carolyn, do you still? I, I just, um, and I'm so appreciative that you had withdrawn the accessory apartment before. I just want you to keep in mind, you know, whatever you end up with, just from a regulatory point of view, our building inspector is a single sole person and our board of health is not even a full time person, even though we're increasing the hours. And so there's, you know, we get complaints. You know, uh, probably a third of our complaints are housing complaints. And it's usually, uh, I don't want to say all the time, but usually it is between uh, uh, a tenant and, and the landlord, you know, doing, you know, rent really comes down to rent, you know, dispute on rent, paying the rent. And so we, we need to, whatever we end up with, we have to have clear cut ability to have regulatory enforcement um you know just straight things if you're gonna you know increase the square footage bedrooms of in your house you got to have a septic system that is upgraded for that additional bedroom you've you know there's just a whole ton of stuff that we're responsible for and um you know it just needs to be very clear cut from a regulatory point of view because we just don't have staff and, and there's no income generated. It's not like there's fees for that. It's not like we can go out and do a food inspection and you get, and your fee is covered. So our, food, our inspector is covered, you know, or a building permit, your building uh, an additional whatever is covered. But for Bob to go out and do a housing inspection for an, a complaint or Alex to go out and do an, a, 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 you know, board of health complaint, those are, absorbed by the town. So, you know, not to be pulled into, you know, really disputes between rent about rent and and making sure our ability to regulate is is very clear cut. That's all. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jennifer. Um, so in Amherst, because that's what I know, and you always hear me say this, but um, we did have the I was first hired there as the rental, the permit, um, the rental administrator. So they charge the fee for every unit. Doesn't matter if you have 256 units or you have one unit, you paid uh, a fee. And there was also a short term, like, a, like let's say you're going away for six months for sabbatical, they had a, 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 a lesser fee per year. I mean, that is one way to subsidize the town. It's, I mean, depending on how many units. Um, but I, I mean, I agree with Carolyn. It, there was, there's, in Amherst, they have four inspectors and a commissioner. So there's plenty of people to go. I mean, they think that, I mean, there's so many units in Amherst, but I'm just saying it's very different than we have in Deerfield. And Carolyn's absolutely right um, about it's the Board of Health side of it. And I saw it, I was a property manager prior to working for the town in Amherst. And so, um, Definitely, that's a considerable amount of work, not to mention um, the parts of the building code that that Bob would need to regulate as far as if you're putting an apartment in a house, an existing house, and you're having a supplemental apartment, um, all of the requirements that, that go into building code. Um, and yes, we can look at other towns and get what they have as far as their supplemental apartments and whether it's detached or attached and square footage comes to be a big play on it. And then we have to have somebody that will look through our entire bylaw and make sure that it, it, it goes with every part of it. Because that's what I think happens sometimes with our bylaw without having a planner looking at it. We change one part and it's not carefully combed through to see that it goes through every part of our um, 
our zoning bylaw. So that's just my two cents. For that. Mm -hmm. I can comment for a minute. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to add to what Jen was saying. Um, there is potential code changes coming in the next cycle that's going to require annual inspections of, you know, two families possibly or bed and breakfast or Airbnb type things, which is going to increase that inspection load annually. Right now it's on, you know, just more on businesses or really large apartment buildings, but. Are you talking about Commonwealth? Like, like, yeah, like going in and to make sure that all the fire alarms work annually and that it has an emergency lighting and that the egress, egresses are all safe. And if this changes, this would include, you know, apartments, we start to add more, it's gonna add more workloads. So I was just adding, just thought that'd be good information to think mm -hmm. about. Okay, and Mary, thank you. And then um, I guess, you know, then, in my mind, that's sort of one more thing to address, like having a position that's able to, you know, that's able to have more hours to be able to do that because, I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but isn't it our goal to increase the number of affordable and people can afford them um, apartments and places to live here in town? So I feel like I've heard, maybe I'm wrong, um, that we want to increase our inventory of available living places or, and or make it um, the ones that are here now have a nice path to legality. So is it our goal to increase the inventory of affordable housing? And if so, then we're going to have to look at the, these problems long term, you know, and it's not just about, I don't know, it seems like we might need more people if our goal is to increase the um, inventory. I mean, I, I believe from what I've seen with, um, you know, some of our different plans and definitely, um, certainly the housing production plan, which was well thought out, uh, you know, a number of years ago with assistance from FERCOG and we've not made much progress on that at all, but it was, things have gotten worse than um, when the housing production plan was um, made and in fact the conclusion of the housing production plan which was as I understand adopted by the town was um, that yes we need to increase um, a range of <clears throat> the range of, of housing otherwise you can live here can I ask a question so it sounds I mean I think our intentions are great, but I think we're walking a little blind with them. Um, could we get what the town of Deerfield frameworks are as it relates to changing of housing, right? So you put an accessory dwelling on or you um, refurbish a building or what have you, like what are we dealing with? What are our constructs in terms of board of health, changes of code? Um, different types of housing so that we know the road we're walking down a little bit. Okay, um, Carol, I'll get to you a minute, but I know that, I mean, my understanding is that our current accessory dwelling apartment <clears throat> regs are in fact out of, out of date. They grandfathered out and they're gone. So <laughs> that's a big, <clears throat> big empty spot, Carolyn. Um, I just, I, our original master plan, I wrote uh, just, cut and paste. And um, the second master plan I was chair of and went and got FERCOG help because it was much more complicated. And then, you know, so that's the last time we've done anything. So it is wicked out of date. The original intent of the accessory apartment that we did have, which was not really well written. Um, I mean, we thought it was good at the time, but um, it was to address you know, the ability of people staying in their homes. So you had a care caretaker apartment or you yourself moved into an apartment and had your family move into the main house or whatever. The idea was for residents to stay in their homes because we have no senior housing. We've been working on senior housing since the last century. And I, Lily and I have been going to meetings since the last century. And now Annalise joined in, but we haven't, you know, we haven't been able to achieve that yet. So the real intent in the beginning was to allow people to stay in their homes. Yeah. What has morphed over time here is that housing is not affordable. 
and that we need affordable units. But the problem is when someone comes to do an application for accessory dwelling, you can't force them to charge an affordable rent, especially if they have to upgrade their septic system, especially if they're doing an addition onto their home rather than say renovating a barn, which might be cheaper or whatever. But you are asking those person that's probably gonna spend who knows how much, but quite a lot of money. And then you're going to tell them you're going to not charge or, or you're going to give them a, a affordable rent, you know, kind of schedule. That's not going to happen. And it would never pass town meeting. So it's two different things when you talk about affordable units, affordable housing. And then when you talk about accessory apartments to live, you know, so people can stay in their homes longer or they just want someone to help with the expenses. So I think you've got to define what you want out of the accessory, accessory apartment and, and be realistic. And, and that's where I had come in and said, you know, you've got to make it really clear to, to us as the regulatory oversight kind of people, what you want us to do. So you can't mix, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm not trying to confuse it and I'm not trying to say, don't do it, but I'm just trying to be clear that it's really two different things, affordability, <laughs> and affordable housing is very different than accessory apartments for different, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Denise, and then maybe we should um, wrap this up. Denise, no, thank you, Carolyn. Thanks, thanks, Carolyn. I was gonna say exactly the same thing. They are two different things and it's not like it's New York City and we can do rent control. So I think they are two different things and I, I agree with that. And I, I, you know, I think, it, and I agree with you, Annalie, I think we should move on with this because I think it's a much bigger conversation. And um, how about if we, um, thank you, Denise, yeah. How about if we do this? Um, let me make sure that everybody has the housing production plan, which is out of date, but still that's what we've got right now, um, that we pull up again, the most recent pass of our accessory apartment bylaw that we were dealing with. Um, I'll talk with Buckland and see how they approached it and um, to be continued. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, good. Kathy and I, Kathy, you, we could talk to Buckland too. I'll put you in touch with one of the planning board members who was the, he was the presenter, mm -hmm. Brian Rose. Um, yeah, I mean, what I was talking about was more accessory housing than affordable housing. I think they're completely different. Issues. Oh, and, and Buckland's was all very much about increasing accessory. their uh, accessory, but also their inventory generally. They, well, they, yeah. weren't, they weren't about, it wasn't about affordable. It was about creating a, a greater number of livable units in their town. So right. very clear. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and we, least, yes, one last thing about also in the bylaw changing our mixed use sections would be important because that would change. I know I heard talk of people saying, you know, apartments above businesses um, in the town center. And like if in Cumberland Farms, you wanted to have a business and then have apartments above um, the mixed use section of our bylaw needs to be changed. So right. that would be a step that we could do much sooner, you know, rather than waiting and later, because that's where you can see bring vitality to the town center and you have businesses and the businesses above have people that either work, at, you know, that live above the businesses that they work at or, or whatever, you know, it just brings... Oh. Oh, so, that was um, number three on the list was up zoning uh, the town center to um, so that's that's an interesting <coughs> different <laughs> way of addressing the question. Okay, and I, and I had somebody that was going to come before the select board and has since taken it off of the agenda for Wednesday night um, because the, the property isn't for sale, but one of the questions was having um, mixed use even in other zones because if they had a business and they wanted to live on the property of the business so that's another not in the town center but that's another aspect of changing our use table to allow with special permit for whatever right. 
Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's good. And sometimes being happy with uh, small steps if that's <laughs> what we need to do. Okay. <clears throat> um, you did uh, see uh, some last minute. This is under other business, not uh, reasonably anticipated in 48 hours. <clears throat> We've had two requests for letters, letters of support <clears throat> for town um, committees, subcommittees, groups, work groups <clears throat> that are going to be going to CPC um, to request uh, <clears throat> CPA funding. And um, <clears throat> so I did send out those request letters to you. Um, I think there's maybe <clears throat> Maybe two ways or two two ways to frame the conversation. One is, um, I mean, I think it's kind of cool that people are asking us to uh, to uh, <clears throat> opine and and give their support and and appropriate too because the the planning board certainly does <clears throat> address many of the issues that both of these uh, groups are addressing. Um, the other piece <clears throat> being that um, we don't know the other. Uh, applicants that are coming before CPC. So does that make a difference um, either in how we may give our support or, or not? So uh, conversation about these requests for um, planning board endorsement or support for CPC applications. <clears throat> In general or specific to the- Well, I think specific, well, uh, I mean, in general to be giving support and specific to these requests. So Kathy, if you, or someone else. <laughs> yes, Denise. I, I you know, I, I think we should just look at the specifics before we say, I, I mean, I don't understand in general. If, if someone asks us, I mean, we should just take a look at it and decide whether we're going to. Uh, I sent them out. Um, well, I didn't see that. We certainly haven't seen the whole proposals, but um, the uh, the um, town common committee um, did send us a um, you know the the picture of the, their map of of what they're looking for, and um, they've certainly made a lot of presentations that I would question whether or not most of us have heard, um, the senior housing um, is requesting um, <clears throat> funding for a market study and a um, needs assessment, both of which are necessary if they then want to go forward with um, grant applications for uh, building pretty su mm -hmm. substantially. So, <clears throat> Yes, well, and, and Ellie, just because we give support doesn't mean it happens. I mean, that has to go right. to the town meeting regardless. So, you know, we can just take a vote and determine whether or not we want to support that. I mean, unless you want to have a discussion about that. I mean, I think I think both are really important things for the town. So, I mean, I'd be happy to discuss and vote on that. Thank you, Denise. <clears throat> Rachel? It might be worth um, somebody making presentation to. So I think that was one of the gifts of the park was that the park had to make so many presentations to various boards. It would be good if um, we saw that. Wouldn't have to take very long. Um, right. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. I mean, they they have made a presentation at our the Connecting Community Initiative. Right. Um, and I know that they did do. Well, maybe it, maybe that's something for us to watch. That's all I'm saying. I just think yeah. the more you know about something, the yeah. easier it is to get excited about right. it and get behind right. it. I believe it's on YouTube. Yeah. Yes, I think so too. And the senior housing, I mean, I don't know about what kind of presentation. I think it's really for um, what to do to do a study on on both sites for senior housing. Um, correct, uh, Larry Lott, or Brayburn and- um, right. yeah. yeah, Brayburn, Brayburn and then the potential town campus. Right, right. right. It's <laughs> not, um, there's no presentation. This is the, this allows us to go get financing or be eligible for financing. Right. You have to prove that there's a need for senior housing and you have to prove that it's, it's a friendly 40B. 
So you have to prove that it's um, that you have eligible population for subsidized housing. I, I think that, that one is up our alley, right up our alley. <laughs> I'm not sure the other one. I mean, the other one isn't necessarily yeah. so far from our alley, quite literally. But um, I think that the senior housing one is kind of a no brainer for us just because. Yeah, I will. I will yeah, right. I mentioned I will mention that um, Kate, um, I was going to say Kate Winslet, <laughs> Lawless uh, um, has pointed out that the um, complete streets, uh, the number one priority with that was to um, <laughs> improve, if we will, the town common to make um, our town entrance more approachable for town economic development and whatnot. So. Um, is kind of in our another alley of ours as well. Well, um, uh, we could. I mean, um, CPC is Tim still isn't on the meeting still. I mean, um, I think they're looking for support sooner rather than later, uh, or these committees are. But um, we made the thing when we look at our. Uh, potential meeting schedule. We we do have uh, March twenty first as the um, reconvening for the town park. Um, if uh, that may be an additional meeting, uh, if we don't need March seventh, we wouldn't need March seventh. But that would be six weeks between now and then, and I don't think that would be enough time for us. Or that would be too much time for us with the CPC. Yes, Denise. Yeah, Emily, I mean, is there a timeline? I know that, you know, from, from reading the emails that, that uh, senior housing has already been in converse, conversation with the FERCOG and that there is some grant money, but it's not enough to do Correct. the whole thing. So, you know, considering you guys have been working on that for 20 years, I would put that sort of at the top of the list and I would make a motion to, to support that. And I would like to, you know, proceed with the vote. Okay. Is there a second? Sure. I, I would second that. Okay. Andrew. Any um, further discussion? I would also like to ask about um, or about the town common. I think that Let's also finish. is. Let's, Are we yeah. only doing that? Okay. Just, yeah, we're making this right now. Sure. Um, as two different votes. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Okay. So. Um, We'll move forward. Uh, Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. <laughs> Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. Andrea Leibson. Andrea Leibson, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba. <laughs> Kathy Wittroba, yes. And Emily Wolfkley, yes. So we will um, send a letter of endorsement to CPC for the senior housing. Um, why don't we have a motion to um, support the uh, application for town, um, the town common committee, um, which I mean, I do, excuse me, I do have. Um, <laughs> So I would so move because I think it is within the purview of what the planning board is trying to do with downtown. Um, there we go. <coughs> Here's the, um, the picture that most have seen. Um, do I have a second? <clears throat> I second that in Mary Cloutier. Um, discussion, I mean, I do believe I know from CPC that I mean, they ultimately will be setting their own priority list. What is worth. So I just want to make one. <laughs> and Carolyn's here. She's still here. Hi, Carolyn. Yes, so right. one, of, <laughs> one of the things that I want to clarify, I think for us that maybe we, we are, um, we the 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 select board has this greater view of like economic development engine we are not per se a motor of economic development that isn't really our job however that said we we do decide you know we we are um in the business of doing the planning part I just want to kind of keep that always clear for us that we aren't, 
um, that really is the select board's purview more. And then they come to us and they say, okay, this is what we need. This is part of the plan. This is how this is going to work. And then we take that and we put it through the sieve of, is that working it for the neighbors? Is that working for the, and we've seen it a couple of times and it's working well, we're working well with the select board, but that is their job. And ours is economic, is not economic driving, but actually planning. I, I just throw that out there because I think that in the, in the in this world, like making it more appealing for economic as a, a, a gateway to the downtown, I am totally behind this. And I think we can say we're behind it, but I just want to keep reminding, I don't, we're not that that board. And uh, I my uh, thought yes. was not was not this is Andrea it was not a, was not in fact about economics it was about improving the uh, sort of the quality of life in Deerfield in in uh, especially in South Deerfield that the um, the common should be um, updated and mm -hmm. improved and it and it does fall in the sense that if we're looking at for instance um, you know, um, frontages in Center Village, for instance, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm just want to keep kind of put, putting that out there because yeah. we do push back on this sometimes. We say, that's mm -hmm. not us. It, it, Annalie, can I just mention that I'm, I'm really appreciative of all your input and also your support. And the select board, the goal of the select board is, is to revitalize downtown, is to make it more walkable, make it more sociable, have more economic activity, you know, all that kind of stuff. But we also want it to be pretty. So I know no one will come out and say it, but I think it's really important that it's it just, we have more trees, we have more green, we try to break up the pavement, we Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control because as you can see from this plan, or maybe not, the, the state owns a lot of our down, mm -hmm. you know, from the original Route 116 um, and Sugarloaf Street out to, um, you know, five and 10. So it's, it's, you know, at some point we're gonna move on, uh, but we're looking at five or 10 years from now before we get organized with DOT enough to get this done. So this is all we can do at the moment, but I do think it will have a positive impact. Um, we're trying to go do the Leary lot. We will become before you to do when we do the Leary lot and we hope to do some of this plan. It will spill over into the common from the Leary lot, Leary lot um, development. So it is important that we try to move ahead with this. If, if the concept is correct, we're gonna do as much as we can and it will be adjusted and it will come before the planning board because it is a site plan kind of review. This is just preliminary. This is what we wanna do kind of, but there will be adjustments. Thank you, Carolyn. Is there other discussion? Can I just say something very quickly? Uh, was that? Who's Kathy, that? Kathy, oh, Kathy Vitrova. Vitrova. Yes, Kathy. So I think that we're looking at this aesthetically, which makes perfectly good sense, but really there's a lot of research as it relates to climate change and what is coming our way in terms of increased temperatures and, and communities that are investing in and have invested in um, greener communities, trees, shrubbery, and, and how they're managing that and decreasing the overall temperature, sometimes by 15 degrees within a community is, is really important. So what we do now affects what's gonna happen five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. So, so looking at the aesthetics is poor, important bringing people in, but really sort of planning for what's here and going to increase and inevitably make significant changes is, is a great idea. National Geographic has some great information on it. Thank you. All right, other discussion? All right, I'll call the vote. Um, so this is the motion was, Denise, did you make the motion? Were you the one? No, I didn't make a motion. I think I did. It was, it was to um, uh, send a letter of endorsement for the um, town common uh, plan to be used for um, applying for CPC funds. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Rachel? Rachel Blaine, yes. 
Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. Andrea Liebson. Andrea Liebson, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes, but I don't recall anyone seconding <laughs> doing a second. Thank you. I was just going to say. <laughs> I think someone has to second it before we I'll vote. second it. Oh, I seconded it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Kathy Sylvester. Yes. Uh, Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba, yes. And Annalie Wolfkel, yes. So we all send that letter to twist. Too sweet. Um, all right. So, our um, were there any other reports from committees? Thank you, Andrew, for yours. Uh, it's just that we're having the CCI meeting on Thursday night. Connecting Community Initiative, and I know I, I'm telling everybody we should report back. So I suppose I just very quickly report back. <laughs> Yeah, we're working on, you know, and I don't, I think I, I've said this before, ultimately we're working on, um, you know, again, a town campus and senior housing is a big part of it. And at this point I'm, I'm working with, um, you know, there are questions about a town planner right now. I think I'm pretty sure that we do have someone to write a grant for the, um, oh my God, community one stop that would allow us to gain, you know, gain funding. I mean, we can gain up to $400,000 and that would be for planning and also for architectural drawings for the former senior center that will hopefully become a municipal center and possibly a senior community center that's added onto it. In addition, also working on, as I mentioned, a shared streets, shared streets and spaces to potentially get a pervious, hopefully, sidewalk between Frontier and the park. So, you know, we're talking about that and on Wednesday night, there's a select board meeting and Lily and John Chief and I are gonna do a presentation on that and we will be doing the same pre presentation on the 17th um, open, you know, for the town to hopefully, you know, listen to. Thank you, Denise. You're <clears throat> Carolyn? I hate to keep, um make your meeting longer but i just want to add what the community one stop is is trying to do is to allow us to have a sort of mini master plan of the downtown so we can uh organize all this stuff and 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 sort of have a phase you know phases of development i mean we're going to do the leary lot that's going to happen hopefully it will spill out into the town common as as um denise mentioned there's a shared streets kind of thing that will put in bike lanes and all that kind of stuff but it needs to be organized we think we have a person denise has been really working hard and we had a lead on someone she had some other people but we think we have someone that will will make a long-term commitment to us to work with us mm -hmm. and um, hopefully we can pull this together. And that's one of the reasons this is, you know, the next few weeks is so important because it will pull a lot of this stuff that people are hearing about, but they're not really seeing much. And the reason why is because we're trying to pull all the committees together. There are seriously about 20 committees working <laughs> together, which is pretty phenomenal really for our town because we, everybody kind of works in silos. It's not saying that they're not working. It's just that there's not a lot of communication and, you know, where everyone's a volunteer. And so it, you get lost in the different meetings. So this is going to hopefully pull everything together. So it's, okay. it's actually extremely exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our next meeting, we do, our next regular scheduled meeting is um, March 7th. And again, we do have one now on the 21st. Um, how about if we keep the seventh on the um, calendar and, uh, you know, potentially we can even have a good working meeting on um, what we're doing with upzoning, apartments, housing, whatnot, um, although we're never at a loss for <laughs> things to discuss. Um, does, that, does that make sense? <clears throat> keep the seventh and the 21st? Okay, and then um, the week prior, the number of days prior to the seventh, I can make a decision about remote hybrid uh, in person. Okay, all right. <laughs> Jen says yes to that. All right, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Rachel. Second. Yes. Second. 
Thank you. And uh, Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Got to vote. You got to vote, you Bye. guys. Oh, yes. Bye. I, 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 I vote. We have we have a roll call here. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and and the select board never uh, you know never yeah. convened a meeting, right. so we're not adjourning. Good. <laughs> <Yeah>. you <go. laughs> Thank yeah, you. That's guys. convenient. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.